Hey guys, uh, Sleepy Reader here, Sleepy Vlog number seven. Um, this will be a disorganized ramble, I'm sure. Uh, let's see what's on my mind. <laughs> I've got a beer. And my wife made more of these really good chocolate cookies. Um, so that'll make my talking worse. Let's see, I've been reading a lot of trades lately, or collections. One I got at a library I really loved, Three Story, The Secret History of the Giant Man by Matt Kint. I'd read a one-shot that had three sort of short vignettes about the giant man, and and this, a look at the cool window in the in the front. I'd love to buy this someday, although once you've read it from the library, sometimes it's hard to get around to buying it. So much stuff to buy. Um, anyway, this is really cool. A grown-up kind of comic book. Um, for some reason, he purposefully makes the pages kind of yellow and faded a bit looking. Not sure what that's about. But it's three stories about this giant man. Um, told from three different points of view. The first story, the point of view of his mom. The second story, the point of view of his wife. And the third story, the point of view of his grown-up daughter who's trying to find traces of him left in the world. It, it's just really cool. It was really engrossing uh, once I got over the kind of faded-looking art. But um, Matt Kint is a really good writer. Um, and he does some really interesting interesting things here. It's powerful emotionally. Um, so yeah, that's that was something really cool. But uh, last week when I did my first real trade review, I had to try three times. It was really hard. And afterwards I didn't really feel like doing reviews for a while, which is why I did a real a quicker rundown of my comic books this this past week. But I love reading reading trades. I'm currently reading the Manhattan Projects, Volume One. Beautifully designed um, comic book or graphic novel. Um, very intense, <laughs> very twisted. Uh, uh, Hickman, Jonathan Hickman, the writer, is more twisted than I realized. And the art reminds me a lot of Jeff Darrow. If any of you have remember Jeff Darrow from back. Uh, he used to do projects with Frank Miller, that's what I remember him most for, like um, Hard Boiled, I think it was called, and I think he did the Giant Man and, oh, I forgot what it was called, but the Giant Robot and the Little Robot, um, that was later turned into an animated show with Frank Miller. Um, anyway, so that's probably a useless <laughs> reference. I got some more trades from in stock trades. They're very addictive. You gotta order fifty dollars at a time so you don't pay postage. But the prices are so good. So I got uh this Essential Warlock. Used to when I was a kid, I think I had this but the cover here is the cover of one of the few issues. I had a few issues of Warlock scattered around and it made him kind of a magical um a magical character in my mind. I also think I had that issue as a kid, or maybe I had a friend with that issue that I read. Um, so I like read one or two warlocks here or there. The The early issues have just Gil Kane artwork at his peak, I think. Um, if you haven't explored Gil Kane yet, I think he's one of the kind of essential artists out of comic book history. Um, and certainly during Marvel and the Bronze Age, he did practically all their covers. Uh, you can quickly learn to recognize his style. I always think of him as the up-the-nose guy. He always shows the, the underside of noses in pictures. Um, and hands, his hands are always going like that and doing things like that. Uh, but he's a very influential artist, a very cool artist. You can see interesting things going on with hands in that cover. Um, anyhow, so I got that. I just got these today. Uh, they just came in the mail. I got them when I came home from work. Legion of Superheroes Showcase. 
As a kid, I don't think I got to read more than a few Legion of Superheroes, but I would see them, and I was just so intrigued by all the superheroes. So just thought In Stock Trades had these on sale for 60% off or maybe even more. I think this only cost me $6. An interesting thing about it, looking at the writing credits, the early early episodes in this, what is this? This is volume two. The early episodes are written by, these are from the early 60s, 1964, are written by Jerry Siegel, the creator of Superman, or co-creator of Superman. And then later ones are written by Edmund Hamilton. And Edmund Hamilton in the 30s was like one of the top science fiction writers uh, in the pulps of the 30s. I mean, science fiction had as little respect then as comic books did later. But um, he was an expert in these uh, exploding suns and exploding worlds and huge wars in outer space. So he was a big influence on, on Star Wars later on. So it's interesting that even into the 60s, he was writing comic books. I knew he had done comic books at some point. And then towards the end of this run are the early stories by Jim Shooter, who I think was like a 16-year-old or a 14-year-old at the time. And I think of Jim Shooter as quite a good writer, although I have to see how he was in his earliest days. But he's done a lot of comic books that I've liked over the years, even though he, he seems to have a bad reputation in the comic book world. Scarlet Spider, Volume 1, the first six issues. That looks awfully thin. But it's supposedly the first six issues. I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. I've, I've read issues 7 through 9 of Scarlet Spider. Um... And I'm really curious to see the, the Ryan Stegman uh, version and just get the first six issues. So that's exciting. And then I, even before James Donnelly did his video about Marvels and um, Kingdom Come, I had ordered Marvels. And this is a variant hardcover of it. And it, only, it costs less than $15. Um, so just some amazing prices you can get on in-stock trades. I sound like an ad for them, but I have no affiliation with them. So I'm really excited to reread Marvels and then read Kingdom Come. I hope to read them close together and then maybe go back and watch James Donnelly's re whoop, review about them. And as probably most of you know, Marvels was one of the first painted comic books, or at least one of the first painted comic books I ever saw, and kind of rocketed Alex Ross and Kurt Busiak into stardom. And it, it sort of views the history of, of the Marvel Universe through the eyes of regular everyday people. Kind of a, a mini trend, that alone, that, that sort of pops up all the time in comic books now, viewing the superheroes from the eyes of different of different people. So that's really cool, exciting little trade haul. Um, as you guys, I, I've noticed a number of videos or comments about people who are cutting back on the comic books they're reading. And I don't know if I'm cutting back at all, because <laughs> I'm having too much fun, but I am getting even stricter about my stick to the two ninety nine comics rule. I was thinking about what is this really worth to me, um, and yeah, you can get you can find a lot of the comic books six months later in a dollar bin if you're lucky, or you know some of them, and maybe that's a smart thing to do, uh, depending on where you are in life and and what you want to do with your money. But there's a certain thrill about getting the comics fresh off the presses and especially doing these videos or watching people's videos. It makes it more fun to be kind of up to date. When I thought about it, what a comic book is really worth to me uh, for that kind of stuff is two fifty, And it would be nice if they could get the price of comic books back down to that. But I guess that's probably not going to happen. But with my 15% discount from my local comic book store, which I get by subscribing with them, I have to get at least 19 comics a month to get that 15%. But 
But anyway, I do. I, in fact, last month I counted, I bought 44 comic books. So uh, with anyway, with that 15%, uh, a 2.99 comic book is actually about 2.54. So I'm I'm getting what I'm willing to pay for them when I do that. Um, I did kind of a shocking thing. I took the 399 Scott Snyder Batman off my pull list but I don't think I'm really gonna stop reading it I didn't buy the zero issue and I may decide later to pick that up but I didn't feel like I had to have Batman's backstory and I that I had to pay uh, 399 for it I do have to say at least with uh, DC Comics they throw in a backup story uh, I'd rather if they just had a longer story a longer main story but that's better than the Marvel comics that are, it doesn't matter what price they are, they're the same 20 pages. Um, anyway, I'm not giving up on Batman, because what I'll probably do when issue 13 comes out is pick it up at the store. But I might listen to some reviews of it first or read it through. That has been one of the, you know, one of my exceptions to my 299 rule. <clears throat> But I don't know. Batman is. I can live without it. I realize I can just read other Batmans. There's a lot. I love Batman and Robin. I really like Batman Inc. Um, and I can always read them later. I can find them cheaper, or I can get them in trades. I can get them electronically if I need, if need be. Um, so yeah, I uh, I was a bit shocked at myself for taking Batman off my pull list. But it doesn't mean I, uh, you know. It doesn't commit me to not reading Batman. <laughs> I was looking at a... I have over here on my other computer screen at the list of um, the July sales for comics. And I actually, you know, anally pulled out all the comic... all 44 comics I had bought last month uh, and their sales figures. So the, the best-selling one that I bought was Batman number 12, which sold 125,000 copies, um, compared to Epic Kill at the bottom of the list had sold 5,600 copies. At the bottom of the list, we could, you know, here on the YouTube community, if everyone started buying a certain comic, that could, you know, a few hundred of us could uh, bump up the sales enough to keep a book going, probably. Higher Earth, Profit, um... Captain Adam, they all have very low sales. Well, Captain Adam is going bye-bye. It's sad to see the, um, the my latest comic that I've jumped on, Frankenstein Agent of Shade, only has sales of about 14,000 and change. Um, makes me wonder if DC will be about to pull that, uh, which will be really too bad. And I do wonder if these books like Frankenstein and Animal Man that are more like Vertigo books or other odd kind of books, if they'll have better sales in trade relative to their single issue sales. And I hope that DC keeps that in mind uh, before pulling them. Same with like I Vampire. Um, yeah, because the Vertigo books sell less than those, but they're still financially viable because a lot of them in trades become kind of evergreen. They're selling month after month after month, um, years after they were originally created. So yeah, it's funny. Um, I guess it's been a slow process for me maybe in the past year and a half or even two years of getting more deeply into comic books and doing these videos makes it even more intense. You start worrying about the sales of comics and whether they will survive and exist. And I have to say, you know, with the Zero issue, the, the DC reboot, and then the Zero issues, and now Marvel uh, about to do its Marvel Now, uh, I'm kind of stunned at how bad comic book companies or creators are at making their comics accessible to new readers. It's almost like a pathology where they can't bring themselves to just do a few things that would make it easier to read. And even when they're doing zero issues like uh, like this Swamp Thing, it was a really good issue, but it didn't 
it didn't serve as a good introduction for a new reader because it kind of was half a story and and to understand the last page you would have had to have read many of the current many of the issues of the current run of swamp thing apparently i haven't so i didn't really understand it um and even like i jumped on i've now read five issues of iron man I, when i jumped on it i couldn't understand what was going on at all and every issue has this supposed explanation of what's going on at the front and it's still not a very good explanation and uh, they just they refuse to identify characters uh, you have to know who they are we're not going to tell you um, and why do they so stubbornly stick to that I, I almost think it's it's their writing for each other uh, they're so immersed in a world of people who know so much about comics that they feel embarrassed to be writing for the newbies or for people who haven't read for a few years or something and it really does seem like a pathology in the sense that they're really hurting their own chances a lot. In uh, one of our fellow uh, YouTubers uh, swapped some digital vi digital comics with me, and I got uh, three issues of the Defenders out of it, and I really liked them. I don't know if you can see that there. Uh, I think I'm up to date. I got issues eight, nine, and ten. And, uh, but they, I can't imagine how they would make sense to someone who doesn't know a lot about Marvel Comics. Um, and a, and a weird thing they have is these little, I don't know if you can see it with this, these little bits of text at the bottom of the page. I'm going to zoom in. Here on this page it says, See everyone you love dies. And I'm going to read a few more of these. I don't know how many of you uh, go back to reading 70s comics. You, sometimes they had little bits of text at the bottom. On this page it just says, Continued on the next on the page following. And they, they used to do that a lot. Um, but then they would also have little blurbs just at the bottom of the page about other other Marvel comics you ought to be reading and it was quite tacky to have these little things so on this page it says Winter Soldier number eight Brubaker and Lark together again and then McKelvey draws great trainers and I don't know what that means McKelvey is the artist of this issue I don't know what it means by he draws great trainers I don't think anyone who isn't really in tune would understand that this is kind of a a jokey um, a jokey reference and use humorous use of of these old little things that they used to do in the 70s this on this page it says all hail Bill Everett and I don't know what that means we're looking at a page with um, Dr. Strange and the black cat I don't know why, and, and Master of uh, Iron Fist. I don't know what that has to do with Bill Everett. I mean, I know a lot about comics, and I can't figure the, all of these things out. And then, it, and then another page, it says, See, the universe will break. We've been telling you all along at the bottom of it. And, you know, this is probably a bad example of, you know, I'm sure a new reader could read this and realize it's some jokey thing, but they wouldn't know what it's referring to. Um, but that's just one thing in this Defenders that makes it um, completely impenetrable for new readers. It's, uh, it's a really good comic uh, for someone like me. <laughs> uh, but, but they could have just done a few things here and there to uh, make it easier for new readers. be interesting to see if they do any of a better job on... Um, on Marvel now than, than DC has with the zero issues and before that with the reboot um, with all their weird continuity choices so people can't understand where they are or, or what's going on it's kind of it's it's almost whoops, I'm playing with my iPad now I apologize I'll just turn it off 
it's almost funny how bad they are, I think, at making, at making comics make sense to readers who are just jumping on. It, it should be the simplest thing in the world, especially the simplest thing in the world to do zero issues. Uh, you know, like this, this was a point one issue, and I couldn't, I, an experienced reader, couldn't understand half of it. Uh, because I, I guess, haven't immersed myself in Captain America lately. I was very immersed in Captain America at different points in my reading career. And their, their title page didn't really tell you anything. Um, I could, you know, if I looked, I could find endless examples. <clears throat> Actually, speaking of comics that are only for experienced readers, I mean, that's a different thing. This is another trade I got. I, I guess I forgot to show that. That was also part of my current haul. I basically got five comics, uh, five, five different volumes for 50 bucks. And that was really nice. Backtracking a lot. Let's see. Um, got a few notes about things. I guess I've covered covered the major things I wanted to talk about. I a lot of people are now doing Google Hangouts, I think they're called, and I tried to um, get myself as Sleepy Reader onto Google Plus, and it wanted to do it with my real name, Damien, last name. And when I tried to put in Sleepy Reader, it said. You know, you're frozen out while we consider your request to not use your real name. Uh, and I've never heard back from them. I think that was two weeks ago or so. So I can't really go to people's Google Hangouts for now. Uh, it's really kind of frustrating, and I would have liked to maybe chat with or hang out with people through Google+. I already have Google+, Plus under my real name, Damien Kilby. Actually, I don't, I'm not trying to hide my name I'm just trying not to have it linked to things on the internet about my comic book hobby. Uh, because I work in a high-tech job, and inevitably, whatever the next job I apply for, they're going to Google me and see what pops up. And I don't want them to immediately think of me as the comic book guy while they're trying to decide whether to hire me. <clears throat> you know. A lot of employers might think, hey, that's really cool. He has this interest, and he's not afraid to be nerdy. Um, but you never know. It's not, it's not a good risk. And I've got a family to support. So yeah, maybe there's some way I can do Google Hangouts through my real name. Uh, I just want to make sure that it's not connected to my YouTube channel and everything. Uh, and Google must know that I have two accounts, and so why would I want both accounts to end up being Damien Kilby on Google Hangouts or Google Plus? I don't know. So I've been watching a lot of videos, a lot of good videos. Um, some of the people I've been watching are. Uh, Roger69501 has been doing lots of great videos lately. Uh, the Dynamic Comic Duo, we finally met the other half of the duo, I believe. Um, his videos, the half who's been doing most of the videos have been great, and now it's fun to see the couple. Um, I have been watching, whoops, Gambit. 896, Agent 42Q, Mongo Stomp Time, Mr. I Talk Apple, Dark Avenger Inc. Uh, DaCosta DC Comics has just started making videos. I've been enjoying those. Odd Fellow Thoughts, of course. Um, the Fiction Basement. Uh, she only does a few videos, but she's definitely worth checking out. Uh, especially because she's a brand or probably within the year, a brand new reader of to comics, and that's fun. Um, that's actually called the fictional basement, I'm sorry. Jim Supreme, Google Geeking Out Weekly, that's my favorite of the sort of comic book shop-based review shows. 
Uh, I definitely recommend them. James White Brandon. James Crowder, 77. Uh, One Angelique. I really like his reviews. Poet Skinny, of course. Red Vitamin Blue. Um, Read him Steven. Greco Fabulous. He is fabulous. M-A-W-0-0-0-0-1. Captain Cummings. Sofa King Matt. Comics SGW. I've been watching a lot. Of Hitman Von Doom. Great epic moments in comic books. So, oh, and congratulations to Chris and his cohorts, Mike and the rest, uh, for the 150th uh, review. Uh, love that those guys are just so consistent turning things out. Um, Dark Avengers C83, did I say that? Yeah. So I'll talk to you all, all of you guys soon. Um, keep making videos. I need to watch you or listen to you. <laughs>